Hello and welcome to the Biz News Breakfast Briefing. I'm Lucy Ferreira for biznews.com. In today's show, we hear from Gigi Alcock, author of Cassinomics, on the booming growth in the informal economy and how corporate South Africa is waking up to those opportunities and investing heavily in the sector. Kevin Ling's chief economist at Stanlib then shares his perspective on Alcock's take of the boom in the informal economy, as well as key insights on local and global inflation following South Africa's interest rate hike of 0.75% last week. We then have the daily news update from our partners, the FT in London. First up, it's Alec Hogg on the markets. Thank you, Lucy. Good morning. It's the 25th of July. And of course, it's Monday. Well, we had some interesting movements on the markets last week. Well, that was only for Friday. On Friday, we saw some, well, reversal. The S&P 500 index down 1%. The NASDAQ was down by 2%. But this after a very good week and indeed an excellent month. In the month of July, NASDAQ is now up 7%. Overall, heading for its best month since November 2020, the S&P 500 index, this is on Wall Street, of course, 5% higher in July. Now, there's a couple of interesting things going on, and that's uh, worth unpacking. Starting off, we've had earnings season. We've had about a fifth, in other words, 20% of the American companies that have so far presented their earnings to the market, their quarterly results. 70% of these have beaten the consensus expectation. This is not surprising because companies do try to manage expectations ahead of their financial results. But this has given some kind of underlying support to people who are looking for a time to get back into the stock market when it is at its weakest. The lower earnings uh, has been interpreted as really no sweat by investors. And indeed, in some cases, it's been a buy signal. Netflix, for instance, came out with numbers that showed that it had lost a million subscribers. The share price went up 7% the next day. Tesla told the market that it had broken a fairly lengthy record earnings profit record. That share price went up 10% the next day. And then even more on point, I guess, is Bank of America, which undershot markets earnings expectations and then it went up by three percent the next day we'll get a better understanding of why investors are looking at markets in this way over the next week when we've got apple amazon and exxon amongst the companies that are reporting the other big issue that is weighing on people's minds is when is the interest rate cycle going to turn yes Although the American Fed have only recently started hiking interest rates and on Wednesday uh, it's expected to increase rates by another 75 basis points, similar to what happened here in South Africa last week, already investors are saying, yes, but when are cuts coming? And the consensus on Wall Street is that next year it, there are going to be two cuts in interest rates. In other words, in 2023, the Fed will be cutting interest rates twice. Reason for this is the expectation that inflation has peaked at 9.1% and there's an excellent interview on Biz News TV that I had on Friday in studio with Kevin Lings, the chief economist of Stanlib, where he reckons that inflation will come down to 2% in the next year. So now think this through. At the moment, the Fed is pushing up interest rates to get inflation under control. However, if you have a look at what Lings is saying, and he's not alone in his predictions, if inflation is down at 2% in a year's time, then clearly this anticipation that interest rates can be reduced uh, is not just fantasy, is it? Well, that's the, the, the story that's going on in Wall Street, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how the markets there perform in the week ahead. Here in South Africa, the JSC All Share Index was up by about a fifth of a percent on uh, Friday. Uh, the rand gained 19 cents against the US dollar to 16 rand 84, 20 cents against the pound to 20 rand and 19 cents, and 17 cents against the euro to 17 rand and 19 cents. And this is all working in with that expectation 
that the Fed is, yes, it's increasing interest rates on Wednesday by 75 basis points, but that it won't be increasing interest rates by that much into the future. In other words, not supporting the US dollar as much as it has been. So the US dollar is now starting to ease back a little bit. Remember, it's at a 20-year high. And as a consequence from that, the rand is looking slightly better. Bitcoin uh, fell a bit over the weekend. We're at $21,877 per Bitcoin. That's down by 2.2%. The Jaltech basket down 1% at 431 rand and 62 cents. On the other hand, the gold price has actually been on a bit of a tear. Uh, that was up $14 over the weekend. And then adding to the $22 that we saw at the end of last week means it's up $36 since Thursday, uh, sitting now at $1,728 an ounce. Reason for that, again, this anticipation that interest rates have peaked and that the, as a result of that, the Fed is not going to need to push the rates up that much further and so the US dollar will start weakening. Remember, markets always look into the future. Um, just to close off here, in South Africa, uh, there's been some interesting moves in the past week. ArcelorMittal uh, was really going like the clappers. When you just have a look at what happened in the last week, a 20% price increase um, from 5 rand a share to 6 rand 20. And this is in anticipation of financial results that come out this week. However, uh, this is a stock that was at 10 rand in January. Impala, another one of the big winners, that was 12.5% the platinum stock, an increase in the past week uh, from 152 rand to 171 rand, but it was at 275 rand in February. Northern has went from 150 to 169 rand. Again, a platinum share, 12 and a half percent as well. But that was at 250 rand uh, as recently as March. So you can just see that it's a regaining of ground that has been lost earlier in the year. But one stock that is not regaining ground is just on an absolute rip is Process. Process went up again last week, 7.8 percent. This is a share that you could have bought. Uh, in May for 714 rands a share, it's now sitting at 1,182. Oh, for those lucky people, why don't we try and find a time machine? Anyway, I'm back again. Same story tomorrow, but stay tuned because we've got two cracking interviews coming up. Next up is Alec Hogg and Gigi Elcock. Lots happening in the informal space. We haven't spoken for a while. Yeah. Uh, the Just off air, we were talking about a land grab that's going on now where finally, it seems, corporate South Africa is waking up to the uh, exciting opportunities in what you've been talking about, the Kasi economy. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, you know, we spoke in, in the probably middle of lockdown, we still had to wear masks and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, no one in the township, of course, or in the informal economy was wearing a mask. Uh, but yeah, there's been this really, uh, you know, the, the, that sector is booming. It's, it's, it's doing really well for a number of reasons. Um, and, and, and which has actually kind of prompted, I think, a lot of companies, retailers and so on to enter into that space. And, and maybe just to say, why is it booming? You know, to a large extent, what has happened is things like cost of transport, things like lockdowns have, in essence, created a, a situation where people are shopping locally. Uh, I talk a lot about now Gasipolitans, people who are very rooted in the township from everything, from entertainment, shopping and that kind of thing. And kind of COVID stay at home stuff meant people started, you know, already looking around themselves in terms of where I go shopping and where I go for my hair and, and so on. Uh, and it's kind of coincided with things like the cost of fuel and, and uh, the inconvenience of you know, taxi costs and, and inconvenience. If you go to the shopping center, uh, queues are, are like since COVID, it's just insane. People shopping stand, center in, in Yeah, in the townships. People are standing for 40 minutes to two hours in long queues. Do you call it locations? I mean, you call it kasi. I call it kasi. Yeah. I mean, I guess when we look at the informal economy, we almost have to separate the informal economy and then the township economy. Mm -hmm. And within the township economy, it's increasingly difficult to define what is a township. So you've got the historical townships. And if you look at Soweto as an example, there were 29 suburbs in Soweto. Now there's 35 suburbs. So, that, that so this is your world. you uh, deeply deep in there. And, yeah. and you've been talking for a long time about the informal yeah. economy and how the formal yeah. economy and 
the media generally, I suppose you could call it, are ignoring yeah. the, the reality of what's happening. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, my second business book was called Gasinomic Revolution because I said there's a revolution happening in informal economies throughout Africa. The scale of those economies is, is un, untapped and, and really unrealized. So, so, I mean, just to dwell on the unemployment figures, uh, um, you know, I've said around 12% real unemployment. And if you want to take the figures of, say, 40% that are touted around, you've got to place the word formal unemployment in front of that word because uh, that reflects to uh, people who earn a pay slip, you know, who have a pay slip and, and earn a salary or a wage. Um, if you look outside of that, if you look at this massive informal economy, the Spaza sector is a 150 billion rand sector, fast food is a 90 billion rand a year sector, the taxi industry is a 50 billion rand a year sector, traditional herbal medicines are 18 billion rand sector, hair salons are 10 billion rand sector, none of them have pay slips. Then over and above that, there's a lot of passive income that we don't measure. So for instance, uh, all those spazers are primarily uh, foreigners or immigrant traders. They pay 25 billion rand a year in rental to South African owners of the houses that their spaza is on. Uh, there's another 20 billion rand a year backroom rental sector, which is a booming sector. But, but uh, Gigi, it sounds to me like there are a lot of entrepreneurs who must be involved in this because yeah. of the, the, the numbers that you're talking about. Clearly, there are individuals, there are people who are supplying the services and the goods yeah. that make up those numbers. Yeah, so, so I mean, if we look at the household, that, that, sorry, the, the, um, if you look at the um, wholesale sector, the wholesale sector mm -hmm. is booming. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at, uh, look, let's look at the retailers. So uh, ShopRite is investing heavily in YouSave and YouSave Egasi. YouSave is in essence a local neighborhood shop. YouSave Egasi, I should have registered the term Egasi, um, is a container-based uh, uh, offering. Container-based? Uh, it's a container that's basically got a, a mini U-save in it. So, so what we... So it's like a little spaza shop, but it's formally owned so because it's from... So from it's a ShopRite shop owned um, store. How many of those um, are there? Oh, I don't know. But across the U-saves, I think they've got 250 odd U-saves, maybe more, maybe 280 U-saves, uh, which are their smaller format versus the kind of shop rights, which are the large format, lower, smaller range of SKUs and stuff like that. But it is interesting, if you have a look on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, yeah. the two best performing shares, company shares, yeah. are Capitec, which uh, focuses on that sector, yeah. And transaction capital, yeah. which focuses on that sector yeah, yeah. as well. And, and they uh, continue yeah. to boom. They were obviously early to market. But from what you're saying now, yeah. other parts of corporate South Africa are waking up to that opportunity. Yeah, so, so look, uh, as I said, pick and pay is launching into that space. Um, uh, you, 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 I think you've even reported on Mr. Price buying out uh, Power Fashion. Uh, you know, most people never heard of Power Fashion. Uh, I did some work with them a few years ago. Power Fashion is a, is a business of kind of affordable fashion wear in townships or in informal kind of environments. Uh, they bought Studio 88. Everyone's like, who's Studio 88? They've paid, I think, 3 billion rand for. Again, what's the insight? The insight's brilliant. The insight is an understanding of the fact that A, consumers in this, call it Gassi sector, the township economy, are, are doing better, have more money um, than, than the kind of, you know, these dramatic headlines tell you. The second part about it is this recognition of, of local uh, purchases happening in what I call township high streets. If you look at the main arterials in the townships, increasingly businesses aggregating around that, that's where the footfalls are, that's where consumers are shopping. And now for Kevin Lings, Chief Economist at Stanlib. I had a very interesting chat with Gigi Alcock, mm -hmm. who's got strong views on what's happening in the real economy versus the data we've been mm. fed. But the big news this week was the increase in interest rates yeah. here in South Africa of 0.75%, three quarters of a percent in most people's language. Uh, interesting to see that America's going to do the same, apparently, and that the Europeans are up by half a percent. Now, for the uninitiated, the non-economists, why are interest rates having to rise? So everywhere in the world we've got an inflation problem. There are very few countries that don't. There are some, if you look at uh, China's inflation rate, 
in the sort of 2% level, well under control, no inflationary pressure within China, different dynamic going on there. And obviously their economies lost momentum more recently. But if you look in Europe, you look in um, most of the rest of Asia, you look in the US, inflation exceptionally high. The world average is just over 10%. The U.S. is sitting it's at... double digits. That double hasn't been digit. there for a long time. Ages, absolute ages, right? And there was all the success in bringing inflation down. Most countries introduced an inflation target. Uh, if you say the average target, probably around about the 3% level, most countries achieving that a target. Um, so this increase in inflation has been sudden and it's been very uh, sort of dramatic in terms of the rate of increase. But if inflation snuck up on them, because that appears to have been the case. Can it also be dispatched very quickly? 100%. So remember there was this debate early on whether this inflation is transitory, temporary, or whether it's persistent. And initially the US said it was transitory. The, the ECB was saying unequivocally this is transitory. And it's because it is, was initially mostly driven by energy, by the, the oil price, by the Russia-Ukraine crisis, to some extent the opening up of the global economy after COVID, to some extent obviously supply disruptions that were going on on over the last couple of years. But if you said, what was the main cause? The main cause was the oil price. How long are we going to have to live with this escalating cycle of interest rates? So our view is that you, what the central banks appear to be wanting to do is front load. In other words, get the rates going up quickly initially, then get to a point where you're at what's called a neutral interest rate. Now, a neutral interest rate is where the central bank feels that interest rates are neither hurting or assisting the economy. And each central bank will decide what they regard as neutral. So move rates up quite a bit. And in South Africa's case, you would probably take, need to take rates up another maybe 50 basis points from here. Kevin, how relevant is this? And now, now just to come back to what Gigi Alcock was saying, he says in the Kasi, as he calls it, the, the township economy, says things are going well. Yes. Things are going very strong. Yes. But that's not being recorded. Many of those businesses are uh, informal and that a bigger and bigger chunk of South Africa's economy is informal. So although the official data is pretty bleak, isn't there a bright side to South Africa that we see when you get in, the, in your car in the morning at six o'clock and the roads here in Johannesburg are full? Yeah. People are, are on it. They're doing stuff. I, I know it, it's, you look at so much data. How can you take that data into account if the only way to get it really is to, is to go and see it? Yeah, so it's, a bit, so it's a gap in South Africa. So over time, the Stats SA and Reserve Bank have tried to incorporate more and more of that. They've tried to apply various measures. And you would say that they capture a certain extent of that activity, but clearly they don't capture all of it. And there's a there's an unmeasured part of this economy. Now, we don't know in truth how much of that there is. It may be it may be that the informal sector is 15% of this economy, maybe it's bigger than that. And so there's an element that escapes. What we do know, a couple of things about it, is that it's probably um, more vibrant than what the the, the, the conventional data would suggest. And that's because, as you say, people have to survive. People are hustling out there. People are, it's not the most efficient part of the economic system. There are many aspects that could be substantially improved, but people are surviving and people are trying things. And, and we need to find a way in this country to bring that in more closer to the formal sector. You don't have to formalize it, but you've got to maybe get it a little, little bit more effective, maybe just encourage it, maybe uh, coordinate with other industries. And you're right, there's an element that we're not fully capturing that is probably better than what we do at the moment. The question is, how significant a difference does it make? So I would just then refer to the social payments. The social payments are phenomenal in this country. And that is, that is telling you that the situation is fundamentally bleak. The unemployment rate, I think, is bleak. I think if you look at how many people are getting the 350 rand social payment, that number tells you alone that there's a huge desperation out there. So perhaps the informal sector is providing some support, some relief, but it's not so big that we're fundamentally missing the dynamic of this economy. It's not that big. 
Just to close off with, the inflation rate 9% in America coming all the way down to 2 Yes. But that must be very good for shares because the, the share market got a panic when inflation went up to 9 So So that's critical in terms of markets because when you look at markets, I think a lot of the pain that we're experiencing is in the price, right? U.S. equity markets have come up substantially. Our markets are weaker. A lot of the pain is there. So you want to generally, as a thought, buy into these equity markets when you're at the point of maximum pessimism. And that's the difficult thing to do because psychologically that feels like the wrong thing to do. But that's what you've got to do. Where's the point of maximum pessimism? And you would say you're getting close to that point in the U.S. because you at the top of the inflation number, you've got another 75 basis points rate hike that's coming through. People, you've got consumer confidence confidence in the US is pretty much at a record low. You're starting to get to that point of, ooh, this is hurting. Now, there are one or two indicators that haven't quite rolled over, including the labor market. So maybe you're not quite there, but you're very close there. You also realize that at some point in the not too distant future, inflation is going to be coming down sharply. And then the debate is going to switch to, ooh, when does the US cut interest rates? And I would say that by the end of next year, that's going to be the debate. Now, you don't want to wait to go into the equity market for that debate. You waited too long because once you're talking about a cut in rates, now you're talking about the start of the next economic upswing. And at that point, you want to be in in these markets, right? So if you wait for that to happen, you're probably going to wait too long. So between now and the end of next year, you're looking for that optimal buying opportunity. And lastly for today, here is the FT. Good morning from the Financial Times. Today is Monday, July 25th, and this is your FT News Briefing. European banks start to report earnings this week. U.S. multinationals are feeling the pain of the strong dollar. And the FT's Ben Hall spoke to Ukraine's finance minister and gives us the highlights of that interview. I'm Jess Smith, in for Mark Filipino, and here's the news you need to start your day. This week, the U.S. Federal Reserve is set to raise its benchmark policy rate by three quarters of a percentage point, just like it did last month. The Fed is struggling to cool inflation without pushing the U.S. economy into a painful recession. These rate hikes have also helped push up the U.S. dollar to its highest level in 20 years. And as the FT's Kate Duguid reports, that's wiped billions off U.S. corporate earnings. We're talking about companies primar- that have big businesses overseas. So that often includes tech companies, but it can include pharmaceuticals, right? It, it includes IBM, Johnson & Johnson, Netflix, um, Philip Morris, the cigarette maker. Um, and what's happening is that one, you know, there's sort of two different translation effects. One is that the strong dollar means that your international sales, which are done in the foreign currency, are worthless when you translate them back into the dollar. Um, And then the second thing is also just that because the dollar is stronger, it means that U.S. products are more expensive than rivals, than foreign rivals. There's also this sort of secondary effect, which is that the U.S. has had stronger growth than a lot of these places. And so the U.S. economy, while, you know, we are seeing it falter a little bit, is doing better than than a lot of economies abroad. And so with lower GDP um, elsewhere, companies suffer because of lower sales. And so that is also a piece of the strong dollar story. Kate Duguid is our U.S. Capital Markets Correspondent. Rising interest rates are also affecting banks. And just how much they've affected European lenders is something our banking editor Stephen Morris is looking out for this week. Europe's big banks will start coming out with earnings reports. Remember, these institutions rely on charging interest on what they lend out in order to earn money. And they have been suffering from ultra low or even negative interest rates now for the better part of a decade after the financial crisis. So this is really going to make a huge difference to banks with big balance sheets and with big loan books. They are going to see a big uptick in earnings from this, which will be good news for their shareholders. However, whenever banks' earnings go up and the countries that they operate in are in financial dire straits, you do tend to see calls for uh, surcharges on said profits or special levies be introduced. So there'll be lots of focus on exactly how much money these banks are making, but also the fear, the potential that governments may choose to come and take some of these away as well. So any commentary around that will be very interesting to us. 
Stephen, are there any banks you're especially eager to hear from? You know, any boardroom dramas you're hoping to learn more about? One of the things that we're blessed by as journalists covering European banks is that there are always sagas and problems. Uh, The banks we've been focusing on most recently is Credit Suisse. I won't go through the litany of scandals and missteps that they've made, but we'll be looking to see if there's any evidence of a recovery there. Now, the other one that's very interesting in a geopolitical sense is HSBC, headquartered as it is in London, but making almost all of its money in Hong Kong and mainland China. Recently, its major shareholder with about 10% Chinese insurer Ping An called for it to be broken up. Now, management don't agree with them and are strongly resisting it. But this is kind of the first time Mark Tucker, the chairman, and Noel Quinn, the CEO, will be out there facing journalists and analysts. And I expect the majority of questions for them will actually be about what are you going to do about your largest shareholder linked as it is to the Chinese state calling for you to break yourself up between Eastern and Western Union. Units. I mean, it's it's an existential threat to the bank, and this is the first time we're really going to see executives address this. So that will be the probably most interesting bank this quarter for us. Stephen, I also want to ask you about U.S. banks. They just reported earnings. I'm wondering if the trends you saw there give you a sense of what's to come with European banks. One of the big stories over there was a plunge in earnings from investment banking, earnings from, for example, helping companies list M and A deals. And then in particular, there have been a a number of losses on leverage finance deals, so i.e. financing behind private equity takeovers. Now, we're anticipating to see broadly similar trends at the European investment banks. We're talking Barclays, Deutsche Bank, BNP Paribas, Credit Suisse, and UBS. But also, interestingly, the US banks hinted that hiring is being slowed or frozen and there may be job cuts to come. And of course, the all-important number for, for investment banks is bonuses. So we'll be looking to see just how badly all of these, well, still incredibly well-paid bankers are going to be hit by the market turndown. And indeed, if there are any indications of a cull of investment banking jobs. Stephen Morris is the FT's banking editor. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has wrecked Ukraine's economy and its government finances. Last week, Kyiv took the dramatic step of asking international creditors for a pause in its debt repayments. The Ukrainian official in charge of this and all aspects of the country's finances is Sergei Marchenko. He's the country's finance minister. The FT's Europe editor, Ben Hall, just spoke to him. Ben joins me now to talk about their conversation. Hi, Ben. Hi. Ben, can you first give me an update on the war itself? Does does either side have the upper hand? Well, I think it would probably be fair to say that Russia has the momentum in the war in the two provinces, Donetsk and Luhansk, that make up the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine, which uh, Vladimir Putin has said he wants to liberate from Ukrainian control. The Russian army is grinding on. It took pretty much the whole of Luhansk province a few weeks ago and is now grinding on. But it's very, very slow going. They're relying hugely on artillery to do a lot of the heavy lifting. And In the meantime, Ukraine has got some new long-range rocket systems from the US, and that's actually slowing down a little bit, the Russian artillery machine. So the war is not stalemated. It's definitely moving, and Russia is, is moving towards its target, but it's taking a very long time. I want to ask how Ukraine is managing its finances as Russia continues with its invasion. As I mentioned earlier, you sat down recently with the country's finance minister, Sergei Marchenko. What did he tell you about the challenges he faces and, and how is he addressing them? So he, uh, Marchenko, has been grappling with a massive deficit, $5 billion a month because of the collapse in the Ukrainian economy and therefore a collapse in its tax revenues. And he's had been counting on Western capitals to provide it, but they haven't been providing it in full. So he's had to rely on the central bank printing money. And he's also had to rely on the central bank selling its foreign reserves in order to prop up the Grivnia. They've kind of fixed the exchange rate to try and control inflation. And I think in the interview, he he kind of acknowledged that this was unsustainable and the government had to take action. It's natural to have some tools which help us to cover our gaps using Mm -hmm. internal 
uh, borrowing through printing money by National Bank of Ukraine. Of course, it's risky if it will be uh, very long. Uh, now it is under control, but if it's un- not control situation, it will create some hyperinflation spiral. So Ben, Marchenko says he's worried about an inflation spiral. What are some of the things he and his colleagues are doing? So they have decided to reschedule their debts to save about $3 billion on interest payments and and redemptions. Uh, They've devalued the currency to reduce the amount of kind of foreign exchange that they're having to burn to prop up the currency. And he also talked about they are eventually going to have to come up with some kind of spending cuts as well in order to, to rein back the deficit. You mentioned Kyiv's decision to pause or ask for a pause on paying its foreign debt obligations. And that was a U-turn for Ukraine. How significant was this? I think it was pretty significant, precisely as you say, because uh, this was quite a sharp about turn by the Zelensky government. They had wanted to honour all of their obligations because they felt that it was important to maintain market access and maintain the confidence in international of international investors. And I think... Also, there was a sort of stigma that they wanted to avoid. I think they wanted to avoid being able to sort of allow the Russians to claim that somehow, ah, oh, look, Ukraine is defaulting, Ukraine is a failed state. So they were very reluctant to go down this route, but they need to save all the money they can save at the moment. And by delaying interest payments and redemptions, if this is finally agreed by all creditors, official and private, should save them about $3 billion, I think, this year, which is quite a lot of money when they only have uh, foreign reserves of about $22 billion. And they're going, and those reserves are going down very, very sharply. And they need to keep them because they, uh, they have some uh, potentially some big expenses coming up. Ben Hall is the FT's Europe editor. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. You can read more on all these stories at FT.com. This has been your daily FT News Briefing. Make sure you check back tomorrow for the latest business news. And that's all from the briefing for today. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and subscribe to Biz News Radio on your preferred podcast channel to make sure that you don't miss tomorrow's show.